Hello and welcome to New Scientist TV. This month we'll show you how some mathematical cunning could add up to more medals for Olympic rowers. We'll also listen to a new musical interpretation of our DNA. But first, here's a look at some slime that could one day be modelled on the catwalks. Cat Austin tells us more. If you want to be fashionable this season, you may have to give up conventional fabrics. Here in London, fashion designer Susan Lee is growing cellulose to make her own clothes. Normally, cellulose comes from plants, but Lee is making hers by fermenting a sugary solution. She produces bacterial cellulose in her studio using a green tea medium, inoculates that with bacteria and grows it for seven days and then pulls it out of the bathtub and stretches it into the fabric she wants. It's easy to produce clothes from this material as it doesn't need to be turned into fibres first but it still has many practical problems. Unfortunately, if you walk along the rain with a jacket as it is currently, it would first swell considerably, take up a lot of water, and then turn pretty fast into some sort of sugary goo. A bit unpleasant. Here at Imperial College London, researchers are trying to improve the material. They're adding substances to the solution that they hope will combine with the cellulose as it forms to make it water resistant. We can remove the sugars then and we still have a cellulose-like material which is flexible and drapeable enough and not too paper-like. They've had some success already, but the material is still a long way off from becoming a durable textile. In the meantime, they're also turning a coconut dessert into foam. We extract out of this nata de coco the bacterial cellulose simply by a hot caustic soda wash. It turns into a cellulose gel and then you take that gel and freeze dry it. And this we can then use to turn it into paper. Next up, there's still time for Olympic rowers to develop a secret weapon. The mathematically perfect seating arrangement. Catherine Delonge tells us more. Approaching the thousand metre mark. It may seem like winning a rowing championship is all down to skill, but the way a boat is rigged can also make a difference. Most of the time, rowers are placed in a left-right, left-right configuration, but it may not be the most efficient arrangement. The question is whether the force contribution from all the rowers cancels out uh, in a complete stroke. And it turns out that for the conventional rig, it doesn't, that there's a systematic wobble uh, of the boat from right to left uh, as each stroke is completed. And that's going to waste energy, something that the cox is going to have to steer against, uh, and it's going to slow you down compared to a boat where that doesn't exist. The perfect seating plan has been debated for decades, but using maths and physics, Barrow has come up with formations where the boat won't wobble. One of these arrangements was recently tested in London by the Imperial College Boat Club. We have different sorts of people judging the situation from quite different perspectives. Does it feel right for the crew? Uh, is it easy to plunge your oar into this type of water? Is it biomechanically optimal and so on? In reality, the rigs may behave differently from the mathematical predictions. They use ideal conditions and assume that all rowers are identical. Even so, Barrow still thinks that his modelling is not far off. I suspect what will happen is that you'll get the same type of configuration, but the answer for the zero wiggle won't be zero, but it'll be the smallest possible wiggle that you can have. Still much smaller than the conventional rig. At the last Summer Olympics in Beijing, the Canadian team won gold with an unconventional rig. Lighter rowers were placed at the front to lift the boat. It wasn't chosen for the maths, but the new analysis may inspire teams in the future. It seems that people assume the standard ring almost by default and never give any consideration to anything else. I mean, maybe it's too complicated, too expensive to explore or do the research, but I think the message is it's worth exploring for marginal advantage at the very highest level whether you could do better with one of these non-standard rigs uh, than with the conventional. Finally, why is it that some people are musical when others can't carry a tune in a bucket? Scientists are collaborating with a choir to provide some insights. Sandrine Kirstemol takes up the story from Didcot in the UK. 
This may sound like a typical classical concert, but in this new piece called Allele, each choir member is singing part of their own genetic code. The notes were mapped from the sequence of bass pairs in a gene linked to ability as a performing artist. Because everybody's got two versions of each of their genes, then there may be one or, or two different copies at different length in the DNA sample. And that's the information that which is sent to, to Michael, the composer, um, to use as his variation for each of the individual members of the choir. But the singer's DNA samples weren't taken just to create a musical score. Here at King's College London, they're being used to study why some people are more musical than others. What we've done so far is take about 250 singers, including the choir, and 250 people who ostensibly aren't musical. We compared what their DNA around this gene looked like in those who were musical, or singers, and those who weren't. So is our musical ability written in our genes? Some evidence shows that it runs in the family, but it's also likely to be influenced by our environment. It's difficult to know who non-musical people really are. Is it because they haven't been given the right cues very early on? Uh, I mean, if you look at some cultures, they, they teach music to everybody, and uh, you know, everybody can play the violin. Whether they can get perfect pitch is a totally different kind of story. The people sampled may not be truly representative, but the team has still found variations between the two groups. It's really at the very beginning of the analysis, but there are maybe one or two little mild indications that something is slightly different, but it's not really terribly significant at the level at which we've analyzed it so far. Now they will look at how this gene fragment and 15 other ones interact with another gene. It's a gene that helps the happiness chemical, serotonin, move between neurons in the brain. But in the meantime, the team hopes the new piece will get people interested in DNA. It definitely shows the variability that we have within our genes, and it's a very elegant way of expressing that. That's all for now, but you'll find loads more videos at newscientist.com slash video. Or you can keep in touch with us by following our Twitter feed, at New Scientist TV. Thanks for watching, everyone. See you next time.